You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. If you prefer real mornings, shouldn't you have a real breakfast? At McDonald's, we get real about breakfast. That's why you can have a savory sausage biscuit with delicious hash browns for only $1.50. It's time to wake up breakfast. Single item at regular price. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Not to be a backseat driver, but can you say for sure you got the best monthly payment possible on your auto loan? Could it be that you might have gotten a better deal by shopping the loan at a few places and have a lower car payment? Next time, before you go car shopping, visit Communication Federal Credit Union first. Our auto loan experts will find you a perfect loan and get you the lowest monthly payment we can. Communication Federal, your auto loan experts. Restrictions apply. Federally insured by NCUA. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well... For a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome-ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gay, so when I'm coming to see you, see you. Celebrity designer Jeff Lewis is back with Hollywood Houselift. I'm excited to be working with new clients. I'm not getting rid of that. I hope I never see you both again. (laughs) An all-new season. Those have to go. That has to go. From, oh, wow. It's been an actual nightmare. To, oh, wow. This is such an upgrade. With celebrities like Josh Duhamel, Christina Ricci, and Gina Rodriguez. Dazzle me, Jeff. It looks like Chuck E. Cheese. (laughs) Stream an all-new season of Hollywood Houselift with Jeff Lewis. Now streaming on Freebie. This is Joanne Jenkins, CEO of AARP. The coronavirus continues to affect us all, and we are here actively supporting you and your community. Every day, we're providing trusted information from top health experts, sharing tools to help protect families from fraud, and creating resources to support family caregivers everywhere. As always, you can count on AARP to advocate for you and your family. Join us and stay connected at aarp.org slash coronavirus. Ready to stand out, Army ROTC prepares you not only as a college student, but as a strong leader, allowing you to earn the rank of second lieutenant. You will be eligible for full tuition, merit-based scholarships, and develop leadership skills essential for your future. Start strong and enhance your college experience. Visit your campus Army ROTC representative today. To find out how you can earn up to a full tuition scholarship, visit GoArmy.com slash podcast to locate your closest ROTC program today. Army officers inspire strength in others. Paid for by the United States Army. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. The following program contains coarse language and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised.
It is Wednesday, my dude. Lives Matter Night right here live on KLR Radio. I am one half of the crew, Mr. Rick Robinson. She's the other half, Miss Stacy Lennox. Don't forget, we do have preemptive programming for the rest of the evening, though. So as soon as we wrap the whatever program, we will go straight into pre-debate coverage because, you know, there's there's never enough time to talk about a bunch of people pontificating on a stage. But again, I am one half of the crew, Mr. Rick Robinson. She's the other half, Miss Stacy Lennox, and we have a guest. We don't do these very often on whatever, so I'm kind of excited. So, uh, good evening, Miss Stacy. Yeah. How are you? Well, I figured this was kind of an important guest. So, oh, yeah, you know. De- definitely. I, it's and, been so long since I've heard the It's Wednesday, my dudes clip. That made my day. Thank you. You're welcome. It's one of the reasons I was kind of happy we moved this to Wednesday because then I could use it again. Yeah, I mean, my kids just make fun of me whenever I play that and I'm amused by it. They're like, that's so old. Yeah, I know, but it's still great. Uh, it's still awesome and it just so happens in my current life wednesday is the beginning of my long weekend so uh <laughs> it's kind of like my friday oh, anyway nice. um so this evening we have with us joseph levine and for those of you who may not recall um joseph is our friend from israel who has done wonders for my understanding of the par- <laughs> parliamentary elections and how they actually work, and the internal politics of Israel, one of our key allies in the region. So um, we decided, given current events, it would be a very good idea to have him back to uh, basically scuttle some of the misconceptions that we're hearing on this side of the pond. Like a major one is anything would be any different if it was somebody other than Netanyahu leading the government. (laughs) So... Anyway, Joseph, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Okay. Well, um, hopefully we'll have some people asking questions in chat. But first of all, can you just explain a little bit about the context of where the initial attack actually happened and um, sort of how how, um, it impacted Israel generally? Okay, um, so like I was saying uh, off air, <clears throat> you can kind of picture you can kind of picture Israel like a like a really miniature version of the state of California. All the green is up north, all the desert is in the south, and the entire west is uh, you know seaside coast. Um, and the shape is, isn't quite the same. I mean, it doesn't have that big bend, but you can kind of you can kind of picture it like an almond. <clears throat> and Gaza sits on the water on the west, right at the breakoff point, right where everything turns into uh, desert. Um, the truth the truth is, I, I mean, I've been to Gaza, and it, it, it was. I mean, I was there before before it was uh, before it was Gaza. You know, before it was cleared out. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's a seaside area. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but there, the 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 way that the clearing of Gaza when when Gaza when Gaza when all the Jews were pulled out of Gaza in two thousand and five, what they did is they kind of sealed off the border around Gaza, and then to the the west obviously is water, and the south is Egypt, and then the other borders are with Israel. And the only thing that was kept around there were some farming towns, um, and those are the areas. There was that a were, was it like an effective buffer zone, like they're talking about now, or not quite? At, originally, there wasn't going to be anything. Originally, the idea because before when 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 Gaza was, for lack of a better term, occupied, um, there was no fence or anything else. It was just. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just that area, um, just like a lot of the West, a lot of the West Bank, you know, with Judea and Samaria, you can go in and out without noticing. You don't necessarily go past some sort of a wall. Um, and that certainly wasn't the case 20 years ago. I mean, it's only mm-hmm. now that we started putting up walls and stuff like that. So when the Jews were pulled out, everything was left the way that it was. Like we said, we left the greenhouses there. We left apartment buildings there and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Then Hamas got elected. 
and we started building a fence around the area because we realized that you know with with Hamas in power there was there weren't going to be um there weren't going to be any serious attempts at peace talks it was just going to be you know more conflict mm-hmm. uh and so over time they started building a fence and they started building you know um in the south the egyptians built uh they built their wall sooner than we did um and can you explain a little bit why i mean so much is made of israel's uh reticence to incorporate the Palestinians into society in any sort of meaningful way, right? I mean, I know there's a, I believe the last statistic I read said about 20% of Israel's population is Arab, um, much of it Arab Muslim. Um, But in terms of incorporating the Palestinians that currently live in Gaza, um, Israel's had no real interest in doing that outside of for some period of time, a work program that existed prior to this attack. Now, (laughs) Egypt doesn't want them either, and I believe the quote, direct quote was, I will put a million soldiers on that border to prevent one Palestinian from crossing it. Why do, the, why do Gaza's Arab neighbors not want anything to do with these people? Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's not just – you're right about Egypt. It's, it's also Jordan and Syria, by the way. They don't want them right. either. Um, I mean there are Well, more... and they were, they were expelled from Kuwait. They were expelled from Kuwait. There are more – by the way, there are more – uh, self-identifying Palestinians in Jordan than there are in Gaza, um, mm-hmm. and and they're they're not allowed to have citizenship. They're they're, they're only allowed to be there, uh, you know, whether in refugee camps or in some sort of you know work program. But they're but they're not allowed to have citizenship. The, the first thing you have to understand is that it's 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 not entirely clear who we're talking about. So that needs to be clarified first. Um, mm-hmm. The, the notion of a Palestinian people as a unique um, racial or cultural entity is Ethnic, very, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very new. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's only since the 1960s. Prior to that, conversations in the region were about Jews and Arabs. Uh, and mm-hmm. I know that that's confusing for a lot of Americans because when you think of Jew, you think of religion. And you think of Arab, you think of race. And that can really confuse people. Um, why isn't it Jew and Muslim or why isn't it Arab and whatever that other category is? And the reason mm-hmm. is that up until the 40s and 50s, Jew was considered a race. Mm-hmm. Um, and it still is in certain countries. It t- even today, for example, I have a friend who's, he's, he's, his father is Israeli, his mother is from Singapore, his Singaporean ID reads Jew under race. Mm-hmm. Um, so up, up until that time, up until around the 50s and 60s even, um, Jew was a race, Arab was a race. And all discussions going back from the 1880s all the way through to the 19, to the 16 war were about Jew and Arab. And how to divide up the area so that these two groups could could live together. Um, somewhere in the 1960s, there started to be discussion of this new or of this this identity known as Palestinian, meaning people who had whose whose relatives or you know whose uh, ancestors had lived inside of the territory called Israel during. The, you know, during the period going back, let's say, let's say the to the Ottoman Empire, let's say, um, mm-hmm. and that confuses that, that confused the conversation quite a bit because when Arabs left in the in forty eight forty seven with the anticipated war, um, and then planned to return after the war was over, which was supposed to be a couple of weeks. Um, and they were promised, oh, you just go back and take all of the land back, et cetera, et cetera. Those Arabs didn't identify themselves as Palestinians. But between 48 and 67, they started to be identified as Palestinians for the purposes of, of, of political control. In other words, if you left Israel in 1948 and then Israel won the war and you've got nowhere to go, you're not one of us anymore. You're not a Jordanian. You're not a Syrian. You're not an Egyptian. Even if you were, 
And so what happens is these people got trapped in some sort of a limbo and had to create an identity for themselves. Um, and what you're really dealing with are people from three cultures, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. And at, at first, at first you could tell that you were dealing with people from three different cultures. Over time, it's turned into two different cultures, West and East, the ones near Egypt and the ones near Jordan uh, and Syria. They're not the same people. They don't speak the same kind of Arabic and they don't see the world the same way. So it's not, it's not like you can say, well, it's because they're Palestinian that they don't like them. It's because they lost, because they're the ones that lost the war. And that dishonor carries with them from generation to generation. Even though they're not the ones that fought the war, they are the ones that lost it. Do you understand how bizarre that is? Even well, it, it's, it's very bizarre. Um, but I mean, so today, do those, I guess, ethnic divisions still exist? I mean, there's Syrian Palestinians, There's, or do they all identify under this separate well, identifier well, now? That's, what, that's what's so confusing, is that it's never clear when somebody defines themselves as a Palestinian, it's never clear what they actually mean by that, because you've got third generation and fourth generation at this point, Jordanians born in Jordan, who are who define themselves as Palestinians. You have to understand what that means. That would be well. Isn't like, the queen? A, isn't the queen a Palestinian of Jordan? Yeah, of Jordan. Yes. Yeah, but that, but here okay. I want I want to I want to try to put this into into perspective. The closest thing to this in America are um, would be, for example, if you lived in Texas and for some odd reason, all of the people of Hispanic descent, of Mexican descent in Texas, defined themselves as Mexican, not Mexican-American, just Mexican, um, or came up with some new term that meant, you know, Hispanic, um, but not, um, not American. So of the, Hispanic origin from Mexico, his, but no longer his, Mexican. <laughs> And no longer American either. Right. Nobody would nobody would tolerate even even for example the Native Americans, um, the those areas those reservations in the United States that are that are cut off from the states they're still federally part of the United States. Somebody born in an, on a, an Indian reservation is still federally an American citizen. That person can run. For, for Congress, that person can be run for president of the United States. Mm -hmm. What happens here is that they're, they're not allowed in Jordan or in Syria or in Egypt. They're not allowed to hold any kind of significant political office or, or anything. Are they even allowed to own land or anything else? I don't know in Syria. I know that in Jordan, they're not. I'm not sure what happens on the Egyptian side uh, either, but I know that in Jordan, they're not allowed to own land. Um, it's it's a very well, very if, stra if you, strange status. If you read some of the assessment on this side of the world, um, what we're told is that the reason they were expelled from Kuwait and that Egypt doesn't want them back is not necessarily because of some shame from having lost in the first place, but that they have been typically very very destabilizing and like ISIS, they kill other Muslims. <laughs> well, they they're they. So I'll t I'll tell you it. Like, I think in Egypt it was the Bedouins or something. Well, it's in in Israel also. People forget that the, that it wasn't only mm -hmm. Jews that were killed on October seventh. Many Bedouins right. were killed. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, the Bedouins almost they almost um, invaded Gaza on their own. Um, okay. They came they came in droves to the border. I mean, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of Bedouins from Egypt. No, the Israeli Israeli okay. Bedouins who who live in these townships, okay. not in, in the in the middle of the desert. I mean, if you go to the desert in the middle of Israel, you can find uh, Bedouin townships that are basically just like they live in tents and they enjoy the this ancient you know nomadic way of life. Um, mm -hmm. But they identify as Israelis. They serve in the IDF. They're um, they're 
they're Muslim, but it's a different it's a different set of practices and it's a different way of looking at the world. And for them, it was a, a tremendous stab in the back to have their fellow Arab Muslims kill them. Um, I think they were at, at the at the personal level. I think they were more offended than Jews were. I think Jews are kind of expect to get attacked every once in a while, but at the personal level, the shock because there's one video where a man actually says, "I'm Bedouin." He speaks to them in perfect Arabic. It's clear that he's Bedouin. His wife is wearing uh, is wearing traditional Bedouin, you know, Muslim clothes, and they just shot her anyway. And so, I mean, oh, they wow. were they were. In, I mean, they, it's, it's it's on video. They were enraged. As a result, and they came to the border in by the thousands and demanded uh, that the IDF let them go in and and uh, and gain you know earn revenge, but uh, the IDF wouldn't let them. That would have that would have been an actual massacre because they have a very very different code of conduct when it comes to these things. Um, well, I mean the entire I, I mean you know credit to Victor David Hansen, right? Um, it, the the attack itself was a return to barbarism that wasn't that wasn't there was nothing conceptually about it that had to do with modern war or modern warfare or the rules that govern modern warfare it was a it was a return to barbarism and well, that's think, why the entire conversation about a proportional response is absurd i think yeah i i, I agree and i think the, the the problem that hamas faces anytime that it wants to do something is that it can't win by conventional means and it knows that it can't mm-hmm. win by conventional means it's not like it can just line up on the battlefield you know and say okay here we come that's not going to work and so the only option they have left is either to agree to some sort of a peace deal or to attack by you know using guerrilla warfare and, and other kinds of you know terrorist uh, techniques but I mean this wasn't even this wasn't even guerrilla warfare per se okay Correct. so if, if they had if they had come over in parachutes and attacked a military base right and engaged the Israeli military that would have been one thing they right. did not they went no, strictly that's... into they, they 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 did the thing that you know oh Rick help me help me what is the uh, famous we're going to, you know, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> you know, uh, completely medie- medieval. You know, we're going to drive them before us and hear the lamentations of their women. I mean, it was it was barbaric. Oh, you were trying to do the Conan quote. I, I wasn't quite catching it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, sorry. Conan. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly um, right. It, it was it was, uh, it was it was definitely a barbaric attack and it was definitely uh, aimed um, it was definitely aimed mostly at civilians, and uh, it, though it's, it's not clear, it's not clear what the original plans were. Um, but there's no doubt that uh, that it was mostly civilians. Although, although again, I don't know that Hamas actually draws any such distinction. Um, they they seem they seem to like to play this game where they'll talk about civilians versus soldiers. Um, when 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 they're being interviewed in the press, but when it actually comes to attack, it's not as though they take the time to you know put on their uniforms and, and attack only those people that are in uniform, etc. You'll constantly hear them say that because because Israel has a has a mandatory uh, military service that everybody's a, everybody's a soldier, and so everybody's a legitimate target. Um, you know, including apparently four-month-old babies and you know, and and, and sixty-five-year-old right. women. Um, but just getting back really quickly to the to, to to the question, just so that we can sort of put a cap on that. The the important thing to understand is that the identity of 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 Palestinian is not one that anybody wants to to have. It, I, I, it's true that that later on it became an issue because they would become violent and they would become terroristic, et cetera, et cetera. But from 48 on, it was already seen as some sort of a shame, as some sort of a dishonor for having been the, the, the victim, the loser, um, almost as if to say, had, had you people been able to defend your own land against the Jews, we wouldn't have had to suffer this defeat in 48 and then even again in 67. You see what I mean? Sort of like the mm-hmm. the, the, no, the, the, the fault all lies with you. 
in that in turn ends up making them into social pariahs. And one of the ways in which they fight back against that is via terrorism. Yes, including against their own people, including against the Jordanians. There was a massive massacre of, 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 of Palestinian Jordanians by the Jordanian government in the 70s because of the, uh, because of the Palestinian uprising, uh, uprising against mm-hmm. the, the Jordanians. But anyhow, but so I the, guess it's just it, 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 it's amazing from sitting here in the West and and understanding that in the media in, in in the in the in the global political world somehow this group of people are all Israel's problem even though it is clear other Arab nations are just washing their hands of them. Well, yeah, the, the like the, if I, if I'm not mistaken, Israel has like brokered to try to give, you know, Gaza back to Jordan and like take it back. We don't want it, um, back to, back to please, Egypt. and yeah, or Egypt, Egypt, and and they won't they won't take it. Well, the frustration the frustration with regard to Gaza specifically is that for such a small strip of land, it shouldn't be this difficult. To find a solution for it, the 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 situation in Judea and Samaria, what people call the West Bank, because it's on the on the western bank of the Jordan River, that's a much more complicated issue. It's a much larger area. Um, it's mixed. There are lots of Jewish towns. There are lots of Arab towns, Christian towns, Muslim towns. That's a whole other story. But the area known as Gaza is a tiny strip of land and there's no reason it should be this difficult to solve the problem. And so the Jews said, okay, here's what we'll do. We're taking all the Jews out. We'll leave the apartment buildings and the greenhouses. You've got this beautiful beachfront property. It was actually the nicest beachfront property uh, in the, in the region. Build some hotels, make it like, you know, make it kind of like Dubai or something like that. Have a great time. That was it. That was the We're agreement. Done. Yeah. That was the agreement in 2005 and we left. And so one of the big frustrations is that it's been 20 some odd years and oh, things have just You didn't just leave, anything. right? You act you actually sent the IDF in to pull Jewish people out. Oh, it was a massive like scandal. It was a massive we're scandal. We're leaving. In Israel. <laughs> yes. It was it was a massive scandal in Israel. There were all sorts of protests and riots and dis- debates and discussions about it. There were IDF soldiers who refused to follow orders. They said, "We're not doing this." And they 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 you know they hung up their uniforms. There were tons and tons of Jews who had to uh, v- evacuate uh, their land, um, you know, and and uh, some of them still haven't actually gotten complete compensation for that because it's because the the expectation had been that there would be retroactive compensation once Gaza got on its feet. Gaza never got on its feet. Um, it's disaster. Well, it's, the, the it's Gaza really, never really got on its. I mean, it doesn't ever got on its feet for the same reason that Yasser Arafat never agreed to any kind of peace deal because they don't really want to govern themselves. They just want everything. Yeah, and Hamas in particular um, has absolutely no interest in peace by definition. The, their stated mm-hmm. goal is the destruction of the state of Israel and the eradication of Jews everywhere in the world. Now, that was the original charter was very, very clear. Later on, when enough people found out that their charter called for the annihilation of Jews everywhere, they changed that part of the charter to say, no, 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 we, we only have the problem with, with the, 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 the Jews in Israel. Um, but the fact remains the same. They want everything. They consider everything to be occupied territory. Um, when, pe- when they talk about the occupation, they mean Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Haifa. All of it, every inch of land, which is why their map oh. doesn't include Israel anywhere on it. it it's just sure. Palestine. Um, yeah. And the, oh. the, the it, problem it, with, it's <laughs> it's problem always it's always interesting to me. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What well, I was going to say, the, the, the problem with Hamas, and a lot of people don't understand this, it's very easy to think, to assume that because they are – Arab Muslim terrorists, that their whole world revolves around Islam and extremism and terrorism. It's not true. The people on top are very, very educated men. They are very, very clever and um, well-informed people. 
They know what they're doing. Well, they live in Qatar. They live in Qatar. Many of them have gone to Yeah, they're, they're not they're, even, they're not in Gaza. They're not stupid, no, well, of course, surely. Well, of course, of course not. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that they, you have to know that these people, the reason they're so good at manipulating the West is because they study the West. They understand the weaknesses in the Western culture. And one of them is this notion of, um, of, of tolerance and diversity as a way of life, meaning as a, as a fundamental priority rather than just a consequence. When you have a society that's, that's homogeneous, but tolerates people from other cultures and integrates them into their culture, that's, that can work. I, I would never suggest that, that that cannot work. But when you have a society... Well, yeah, the, the, prob, the problem is not racial diversity, it's multiculturalism. It's multiculturalism, and it's also... it's Yeah, it's multiculturalism, and it's also um, this anti-integration approach, where mm-hmm. all cultures are equal, everybody's welcome, you just do your thing, and, and everybody will have a great time. That the moment they identify a weakness like that, they will find a way to use it, and they're very, very good at it. And so, what happens is discussions about Hamas, discussions about the Palestinian people and their suffering in the West, they make sure those discussions revolve around uh, racial equality, diversity, um, fairness. They use terms like apartheid, they use terms like um, like uh, colonialism, white supremacism, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, the fact is they use those terms because they know exactly where the weaknesses in the Western culture are. And you have to remember the reason they know those weaknesses is because they were trained by the KGB. The initial impetus for a, for, for a Palestinian people was a KGB notion very much like what you see the the the, the consequences of communism throughout um, liberal Western culture, you see you see mm-hmm. it here as well. They identified the weakest parts of the Western culture, and they have aimed at them ceaselessly since the 1960s. And in the past 60, 65 years, they have managed to 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 break through. They have managed to 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 weave. This sort of bizarre net of left wing and extreme Muslim ideas into what's an almost miraculously uh, confused uh, political ideology. Because you would never, oh. you would never expect people on the left to support a culture that is anti everything the left believes in. And yet, but it's not. But it's not. I, I, well, I mean, I mean, it, I mean it, even things like well, I, I well, mean, well, even we call like gay rights well, we, and women's rights, and you know. No, 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 no. They, I, I mean, <laughs> the communists in the United States on the left, which is what the far left is, mm-hmm. right? Communist, communal, fascist, fascist, communist, whatever you want to sure. put, whatever mm-hmm. label you want to put on them, right? They are doing the same thing within the United States with identity politics that the Russians have done and that Hamas have done. You don't get to be a gay man in this society unless you're with them. You lose your gayness. For example, they'll tell Dave Rubin he's not really gay. Okay. So it's just, it's literally, I mean, when you, when you see, when you see, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar talking about their trans brothers and sisters, you know they're full of shit. They're absolutely as full of shit as the leftists in this country. Okay. That's true. Like, yeah, that's they, a good like point. they they um they they actually during I forget who said it, I think it was the woman who wrote the 1619 project, that pro, that bucket of drivel. Um but she actually said something. Well, you're not politically black, right? Yeah, that's so, you, know, you make you make a very a, good point. Yeah, there's a difference yeah, between we call it we call it here the red green alliance. It really has nothing to do with the religion and the religious precepts of them of of 
Islam and the the social mores of the left, most of the most of the really radical um, queer contingents and radical feminism and everything on the left are just useful idiots to begin with, and they would shut those people up if they ever came to power anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like they've done in every other authoritarian regime, they will not tolerate that kind of stuff. Um, So those are just the useful, useful idiots to the movement. Right. So you have the Red Green Alliance where, you know, Hamas and and the radical Islamists see their counterparts in the West as useful idiots. And once they get rid of the rest of us who see this all very clearly, they'll have it out between themselves. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah. It's shared hatred. It's shared hatred of the enlightenment and Western values that puts them together now. That's it's, it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that you say that. Yeah. I, I think, I think you make an excellent point. I would, I would add, however, that it's in, in this case, it's not just in, in, in other words, in the case of, of institutions like Hamas, it's not just a hatred of the West. This is something much, much more, um, much more dangerous than a hatred of the West. This is a this is a commitment to overtaking all cultures. Uh, I didn't hear you. I think I lost you for a second there. Yeah, I don't know what just happened, but you. Oh, were, they were, right. Oh. <sighs> Sorry, guys. I had to come let my dog in. He's out here barking his head off. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, they raised the Palestinian flag outside the uh, Golden Gate Bridge today. Like, if the left wants to have a serious conversation about colonization, we could have that conversation. But it's not Israelis colonizing <laughs> Israel, and it's not it's not you know the white man colonizing America at this point. We have some other people that are trying to colonize us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's also, I think it's also very important. I think it's also very important to understand that in the in the case of of what they call radical Islam, um, the goal isn't the the goal. The stated goal of radical Islam is a one world Muslim entity with no other law. Well, no other option. That, that's a stated goal. Um, and I think that that's one of the other things that a lot of the people in um, a lot of the people in Western society who ought to know better. Uh, have failed to have 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 failed to recognize uh, this threat. You do. Well, hear it's, it, it's the it's the arrogant of our cultural elites in the West. They do not believe the Islamists. They don't take them at their word. They're not hiding the ball. <laughs> Just no, believe yeah, what exactly they right. say. I mean, all you have to yeah. do is believe what they say. You don't You don't transpose Western values on people who don't hold them. Well, that's exactly that's right. What, and, and, uh, and, and, and that's a mistake that, that um, Bin Zaid, I don't know if you're familiar, he's the, um, the, the, Zaid, the Bin Zaid family is the, the family that runs um, uh, Abu Dhabi. And uh, uh, Salman, uh, Salman bin Zaid um, said this in an interview a long time ago. He said, there, you know, you're, you're quickly heading toward a situation where most radical Muslim terrorists will actually have been uh, raised in the West rather than in the Middle East. Because oh, we, we, have, we have a second generation problem. Look at Rashida Tlaib. She's never, she's never lived in Gaza. Correct. She has no idea what it would mean to live under a Muslim theocracy. She certainly wouldn't be wearing that bright, wet, red, ugly freaking lipstick. I promise <laughs> you. Okay? She's not a pretty woman. She'd be all covered up. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, like, she, she, has, she, she talks about her grandma and the fig groves. Honey, they destroyed the greenhouse. There's no fig groves in Palestine. Why are you lying? Yeah, Wait, although al- although I'm not sure I'm not sure whether she comes from. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure whether her family is in the West Bank or in Gaza. I'm not sure which one. There, there is a big okay. difference. But okay. but but your your point your point remain your point remains the same. A lot of the a lot of the um a, a lot of the stories being told and a lot of the uh this this notion of of Palestinian identity. Remember, it's the only place in the world where you can be a third and fourth generation refugee. 
there, that concept doesn't that concept does not exist anywhere else. I can't claim to be a refugee from Spain just because my family was chased out of Spain in the 1490s. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, as a general rule, refugee status is is given to one generation, maybe two. Um, and ref it's either refugee status or citizenship. It's not both. But for somebody to be a citizen well, of but... Sweden and a, I mean, a citizen of Sweden and also, right. you know, third, third generation and also have refugee status in some undetermined eventual state of Palestine is an extremely manipulative approach. And it's an approach that always allows those individuals to have a kind of um, – a kind of it, it earns you social justice points, you know, social justice, justice status that uh, that I think is exceedingly dangerous. Um, and that's where you see somebody like Rashida, whose whose entire focus seems to be on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. She's supposed to be the, the a representative in the United States House for yeah, some but, district of, yeah. of Michigan. I don't yeah. know that she is. I don't no, know if she's she, ever she, won. She's, 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 she's a representative for the Palestine. Of Michigan. Well, that, 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 you know, that's, exa that's exactly it. I don't think yeah. that she's ever she, once she's, involved she's, herself she's from in the American Islamist politics. ghetto. She's from the Islamist ghetto. She's doing exactly what she is supposed to be doing in Congress, just as Ilhan Omar is doing exactly what she's supposed to do in Congress. And the only upside to any of this for me would be watching Alexandria Ocasio Cortez have that lipstick wiped off her mouth and shoved into a burqa and possibly beheaded by her friends while they laughed because they, she doesn't understand that she's the useful idiot in that trio. <laughs> I, yeah, I think, I, I think that's exactly right. And um, I mean, we, we've, we've had some famous incidents like that of, uh, I mean, listen, well, but I, mean, it's, I think look, it's very look, important look to understand, by the way. Look the what October they did though, attacks, Joseph. I think I, th that's actually a, a great example. The October 7th attacks the overwhelming majority of people killed on October 7th were far-left Israelis. The only far-left mm -hmm. Israelis remaining in the country, because they're, they're, from a political standpoint, they're all, the, the far-left in Israel is all but dead. In the last election, the, the far-left party got six mandates out of 120. I mean, they're, they're dead in the water. And the people who stayed, the people around Gaza, the, that area known as the Gaza Envelope, um, those were far left Israelis, kibbutz, uh, kibbutznikim, we, we call them, people, you know, the kibbutz types who still have some kind of uh, notion of a, of, a, of a grand peace deal and a, and a socialist, uh, you know, um, a utopia of some kind. These were people who were, who were... Um, True believers. True believers. Yeah, peace activists, people yeah. Who, 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 the work program, most of the work program uh, were farmers working in these farming, these leftist farming towns right around Gaza. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that they, some of these people worked there for 10 and 15 years and, and they were, they were collecting intelligence the entire time. The, the maps that we found on a lot of these terrorists were highly detailed, could only have come from people who had been inside of the homes because it, it went, came down to how many dogs they had in the house where the secure rooms were, because every just about every house in Israel has a secure room. Um, the, the level of detail in many cases was provided by the people who were being paid as part of this notion that if they just, if you just improve the economy and if you just improve your relations, if you're just nice to them, they'll eventually accept you. And and so I, oh, I think it's important to understand just how sinister the, the approach is. <laughs> That's the U.S. State Department, too. Who was it during the Obama administration, Rick, that said, you know, they just want jobs at McDonald's or something? I mean, it, 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 uh, you know, if the, we got the, ISIS the, jobs, they'd stop being radical. OK. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I but I mean, you also have to look at what what they like. They are so good at using the bias of the left and the center left here. Right. Because they have to understand at this point they have lost close to half the country. Like we're not buying it anymore. Like, if you look at polling now, 
We want yeah. to severely decrease Im immigration. We want to yank student visas from these little monsters on our college campuses. Those are very popular opinions in these United States of America at this point. Um, it's well, really think... only the Biden admin. It's only the Biden administration that's listening to care anymore. None of the rest of us care. Forgive the pun. But you have yeah. to look at how well they played it in this country. Because do we have any Palestinian male representatives in Congress? Of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course not. Do we have any Islamist male males in con no, they're all women, as if that would even be possible in their home culture. The well, yeah, that's that's right. Um I think I think that, that, that goes back to what I was saying, which is that this is this is a uh, the, the people at the top are exceptionally well educated and they understand Western culture extremely well and they understand that it's in the nature of the of the Western society to try to find a way to accept others and to bring others into your way of life, even if the those others are going to be different, look different, act different. And that's a beautiful idea on paper. But the moment that you have the moment that you have somebody from and, and I think this goes back to the very first conversation that you and I ever had, where where we talked about the fact that even though Israel is in many ways a Western country, it has a lot of influence from the West, this is still the Middle East. And mm -hmm. the attitudes here on this side of the globe are very different from the attitudes in the West. And one of the things that, dis that distinguishes this part of the world is that they don't mind taking a very long-term approach toward invasion. The idea of a thousand-year plan um, the, or something you hear from the Chinese, it's something that you hear from the Muslims. The idea that if you go get there eventually, no matter how many generations it takes. And so if, if, if anybody in the United States is, is, is foolish enough to think that what happens here won't happen there, just take a look around. Take a look around. Every country in the world today that has allowed more than a few hundred radical Muslims is now at some stage of invasion. And I would say in some places that invasion oh, is I mean, entirely yeah. complete. I mean, you can see it in France. Um, it's in the UK, the UK, France, Sweden, which was which. I mean, yep. I remember growing up. You would okay. always hear. It's Sweden actually. I read. I read. I read it. I read it. Great. Right? Yeah, I read a great headline the other day. I think it was out of, I can't remember what the paper was, but it's like being whispered by your, in European parliaments, Victor Orban was right, but nobody will say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I think there's also, there's also one other very important point that has to be uh, discussed. And this is also something we've discussed in the past. There's a tendency in the United States in particular, but in the West, to treat all of Islam as some sort of a monolith. And, for, and they forget that the Persian-Arab divide within Islam mm -hmm. is one of the most significant global deciders of conflict. And... Mm -hmm. If the West doesn't wrap its head around that idea soon, um, it's going to it's going to fall. They're going to end up becoming proxies. Every country will end up becoming proxies in the Persian Arab conflict. Um, and I I, I I can't stress this enough: the difference between Shiite and Sunni Islam, and the difference between the those Saudi factions, Arabia and Iran. For, I mean, simply stated Saudi Arabia and Iran, but it's actually much more intricate than that because yeah. it's but from, Iran. From a global, from a blo but from a global per political perspective. Yeah, it's for those essentially of us on the Saudi right, Arabia versus it, Iran. Exactly. Well, um, but, and then, but for those of us on the right that understood how historic the Abraham Accords actually were and how different the approach that was taken actually was, right? Correct. It's like we're going to tie together people economically who are ready, who are looking towards a future. You know, perhaps the Saudis understand there's going to be less reliance on oil and gas and they have to figure out how they're going to move forward in that economy, whatever. Right. 
but we can we can figure out how to make those ties in a different way. And we're just going to jump over these people because they're assholes. And that's what and think, I'm sorry. That's what that's well, what the I, Palestinians yeah, I think it's also are. Important, and, I, I think it's important to understand that 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 the. The the the, the Persian, like you said, Iran and Saudi Arabia, but more more generally, the Persian versus um, mm-hmm. versus Arab divide is ancient. This is they have been they have been at each other's throats for fifteen hundred years. The the hatred that they have toward each other cannot be expressed. It would take me an entire uh, radio episode just to start explaining how much these two groups hate each other, and. As a res- as a result, the Abraham Accords, what it basically did was recognize the fact that if the Israelis were to belong anywhere, it would be on the it would be with this, the, the the Sunni Muslims, because the Shiite Muslims in their current configuration is Iran and Qatar and Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the and, and and these other groups that are aligned one way or another with the the Sunni side. I mean, with the Shiite side. I would say that the the one mistake that Hamas made, and I think the reason why these these events, there's at least some silver lining to this cloud, is that a lot of Sunnis realized that they had been, they were going in the right direction to begin with when they um, when they headed toward the the Abraham Accords. I've read a lot, you know, well, the, I have the, the, the UAE, advantage of, re, of reading Arabic. I, I the UAE of, statement was very strong. The UAE statement was very strong. The Saudi Arabia statement was also strong. It was just it was just uh, it was just stated quietly. Um, mm-hmm. The statement was strong, but the message was strong. But the statement was quiet, which is um, that uh, that the um, that Saudi Arabia fully intends to get, get back to its peace talks with Israel the moment this war is over. The Crown Prince was very clear about that. Remember, there were Israelis in Saudi Arabia when the attack happened. Um, there was a there was a there was a, a conference going on trying to hash out the details of a of an eventual peace deal with uh, with with Saudi Arabia. Well, and the, some observers believe that's why the attack happened, right? Like, the, well, that's why the attack happened when it that did. Process, yes, yeah, yes, that's, yes. That's, de- that's definitely what happened. It's definitely why the attack happened when it did. But I think rather than Rather than injure the process, all it did was bolster the process while delaying it. Because now, all of a sudden, it was it was clear. I mean, I have the advantage of reading Arabic. And if you go into Twitter, into Arabic Twitter, and see what a lot of Saudi Arabians and, and even Kuwaitis are saying about the attack, what they see here was basically thousands of Muslims thousands of Arab Muslims sacrificed on the altar of Iranian uh, of the Iranian regime and that's that's a that's a violation of a kind of blood honor code that you have within the Arab world the idea that Arab people have to die so that the Persian empire can be rebuilt is a deeply offensive concept in the Arab world. And while the initial attack might have, you know, might have killed however many Israelis, the end result, and again, nobody actually believes the numbers coming out of, uh, out of the Gaza mm-hmm. health industry, but let's right. say for a minute that they're true, and 20,000 Gazans have been killed. That means 20,000 Arabs were sacrificed on behalf of the Iranian Persian regime, and that's not something that you do. And so there's there's actually great. Well, but isn't that isn't? Taken. But isn't that um, Hamas is willingly? I mean, they are willingly operating as a as a um, client of the Iranian regime. And like that's where the offense. And that's why. That's why. The Palestinian people are now such complete social pariahs because of the mm-hmm. fact that at the end of the day, you are Arab and you are siding with the, the, the Persians against us. And that's that's a, a deeply offensive. They take a kind of, you know, that scene in the in, in the in the Godfather where Michael says to Fredo, don't ever take sides against the family again. Yeah. 
But th that's something that's actually very, very true within Mediterranean culture, maybe even going as far as the Italians, but certainly true among the Arabs. You don't side with the Persians against the Arabs. You never dare do such a thing. How but now you have a whole a whole subset of Arabs. I mean, if, if you Now if you have you a take, whole subset, exactly. You have a whole subset you, of Arabs if, I mean, if, who if fight you on take, behalf of Iran. And yes, that's true of the Muslim Brotherhood. From inside Gaza and the West Bank, they approve of what Hamas is doing and they approve of the attack. Absolutely. And you also see it in Syria and you see it to a certain extent uh, with the but that's why the Muslim Brotherhood has has be, has become you know they're, they're outcasts in the Arab world. You can't express pro Muslim Brotherhood sentiments in the UAE. It's illegal. You can't express them in Egypt. You'll get killed in the middle of the street. And so you know you, th 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 that's why you see that the that the idea of a of a, of a peace treaty um, not only did they not prevent the treaty from taking place, I think they now guaranteed that it takes place. Um, and okay, you just that, you just have to wait till the Republicans in the White House, okay? Joe Biden yeah, can't I, have I, that. I, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. It's not going to happen under Biden. First of all, first of all, it's not going to happen. I can't imagine Biden is going to win win re-election. I mean, I, I and it, it it's not going to happen within a year. Let's put it that way. Um, right. It's going to take a very very long time before this war is completed and and the whole question of Gaza is taken care of. But well, um, so like just to circle back because we're going to have to go and do our debate coverage here in a moment. Mm, um, yeah. So the ceasefire is over. Hamas broke it yeah. at a bus stop. Um, yeah. In the West, the the Biden administration is putting some degree of pressure on the Israeli government because they truly believe that this is a Netanyahu thing. Can you just explain to everybody? that Israel as a country is united in the approach of saying that Hamas must be eradicated, that then oh, there, is no left, there is I'll no left wing further. over there that would stop it. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll even go a step further. I think the, the, I think the response in Gaza would have been more violent had it not been Netanyahu. I think because mm -hmm. Netanyahu faces his own political challenges here in Israel and is afraid... Uh, of losing uh, any kind of momentum that he might have, I think he's actually been much, much more patient. I think had it been somebody like Naftali Bennett or Gons had, it, had or, it been yeah. somebody like Gans, I think it would have been it would have, the response would have been far more violent, especially in the initial in the initial you know in the couple of days after the attack. I think the, the mm -hmm. you know Netanyahu sort of sat and waited and called for a coalition government. You know, like a, they they called it the Memshelat uh, Achdut, kind of like a unity government. Um, you know, bringing guns well, be, in. Be, and bringing but other globally, people. he has to. Globally, he has to. He he's he's in as much favor globally as the new Argentinian president, as the El well, Salvador exactly president, point. as, exactly as Victor been, Orban. I mean, yeah, he's, exactly he's, in, the, he's in the hegemon like... of right-wing leaders globally that yeah. the global elites at the UN and the WEF want gone because they yeah. actually believe in, you know, independent nations and all that other that's, stuff. That's, so. that's exactly right. There's a reason why Clinton was able to bomb, uh, what was it, Bosnia? Um, not Bosnia. Well, I mean, George W. Bush bombed Afghanistan with alacrity. <laughs> well, that's know? exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, there's, there's when, when, but what I'm saying is when, when Clinton did it, there was very, very little hubbub about it. Same thing with mm -hmm. Obama. Obama, Obama, he, he I mean, he, he bombed Syria. Everything. I mean, yeah, he mm -hmm. bombed whoever he wanted, you know, with, 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 with impunity. I think had it not been Netanyahu, had it been Gantz, I think the, the, the response would have been much more violent. Um, so the, the notion that the problem is Netanyahu, I think is, is not only incorrect, I think it's, 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 it's quite the opposite. I think if it, when, when we have our elections, because our elections are coming up relatively soon, um, I, I think you're going to find that the country is now reeling to the right. If there was ever, if there was ever even a modicum of left before, I mean, there, there isn't a left wing in Israel. But even what's considered right wing is now not considered right wing anymore. I mean, the, mm -hmm. if, like you were saying, how how the, 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 you hear things being spoken about in the United States that were never spoken about before. You see that here as well. You see a, yeah. a, a vicious swing to the right now. Well, I mean, you, you know, we're just looking. We're looking what's happening in our major cities. 
Sorry. And going, no, no. That's right. I mean, there there's some of us that um still remember. Like it's very, it's very weird to be our age, Joseph, right? Because mm. we have one significant foot in the generation that fought World War II and defeated both communists and Nazis, right? right? <laughs> and one foot in the now. And right. we bridge both. We understand from growing up at their knee what never again means. I mean, my grandfather exactly. was literally in a plane leaving Guam when they were turned around because the decision had been made to bomb Japan. Oh, that's interesting because my grandfather also served in Guam. Yeah. So, I, I mean, wonder, it's just, I, it's like, it's like we, we have, we have some kind of history here that for some reason, the education system in the West has not imparted. And it, it's yeah. just really, it's really frightening. Yeah, I agree. Unfortunately, we are overtime. We gotta go. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, all right. It was it, it was right. uh, it was great being with you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming on with us. My pleasure. I'm gonna get to bed now. It's uh, it's three a.m. here, so I'm gonna get to bed. Yeah. Go to sleep. Was, that's the other reason I was trying to close for you. I know it's early where you are, like super early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's three a.m. now. All right, have a good one.